Let's uh, go ahead and <coughs> move on to uh, to the message on eternal security. Eternal security, the second one. Um, turn in your Bible to John chapter 8, please. Can anybody tell me where that is? Just after 7, that's correct. You're learning. <laughs> pinpointed it. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. <clears throat> God's word says, And then Jesus, and then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. <clears throat> they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, I verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. <clears throat> Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening, and I thank you for the folks we have here. And I pray, Lord God, that you give me wisdom and help me to present this in a manner that everyone would comprehend, that they'd be comforted by it. And they'd be, they'd be encouraged day after day in what we learn here. This eternal security. We pray it of thee, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so this week we're going to talk some more about eternal security. You know, this thing is very intimidating. It's got this rod that sticks right in my face. It doesn't have to, I guess, because this one here, you can still hear me okay, right? All right. <clears throat> so we're going to talk some more about eternal security. And, and if you recall, the last time we had the study, I said that as strange as it may seem, the more you study and the more you learn about your Heavenly Father, the more you'll realize that He wants you to be secure in the salvation that He's provided for you. It cost Him a tremendous cost, and He, and he provided it at his expense. We also pointed out that most people who preach that you can lose your security ignore the context of the verses that they that they use to argue against eternal security. They ignore the context. <clears throat> and as you look deeper into these verses that they use, you'll understand that they truly have a different meaning from uh, from what these people are using. <coughs> Salvation by faith alone is not compatible with the belief that one can lose their salvation. You're saved by faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, it's, that's not compatible with losing your salvation. If I have to do something or not do something in order to keep from losing my salvation, then that's faith plus works. It's not salvation by faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by faith are you saved through... For, for by... <coughs> let me get... <coughs> I had a little trouble. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, we need to take God's word on it. He says our salvation is by faith. By faith are you saved. By faith are you saved. Uh, he gave you eternal life the instant you trusted in Christ. That's not eternal life that will start in the future. That eternal life starts the instant you trust in him. I give you eternal life. He didn't say I will give you eternal life. He says I give you eternal life. That eternal life starts the instant you trust in Christ. So it's not 
something that will take place is something you, you, you've already started on eternal life right now. You, you'll move from this, this physical life, you'll move to a, uh, a new life in heaven. But you'll, but you'll have, but you have the eternal life. There's not going to be a segment of time here. There won't be a time when it's cut off. It's not going to happen. You can take God's word on it. So that when we understand that God's unconditional love, when we understand what his love means, then peace and joy are going to take a whole new meaning in our life. You've been saved, and he loves you, and he adopts you into the family of God. So who can you trust? Think about this. Can you really trust any of your own relatives? Can you really trust any of your friends? It's hard to really trust somebody if you've never really if you're never really sure where you stand with them. If you're not if you're not confident where you stand, Jesus has given Himself unconditionally. Unconditionally, when you trust in Him, you can really trust in Him to save you unconditionally and eternally. John. Uh, 1 John 5, 13 says, And these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life, that you might believe on the, uh, the Son of God, that you, that you might know that you have eternal life, that you might know that you have eternal life. I want to say that over and over again, that you might know that you have eternal life. So many people I've talked to don't know that they have eternal life, but the Lord says you can know. You can know it. Jesus wants you to be secure. Jesus wants you to be confident. He loves you. He doesn't want you to have to go around wondering all the time. He wants you to be confident in knowing that you have eternal life and confident in your day-to-day -day grind that you'll spend this life on this planet in confidence that you're eternally the son of God, that you'll be, or, or daughter of God, your child of God, that you'll be eternally with him. So we also learned last time that eternal security is not just the Baptist doctrine. The biblical doctrine that the Baptists have included in their doctrinal beliefs, the doctrine of eternal salvation, it goes beyond the realm of theology alone. It's something that goes with you all throughout the week and forever, day after day, night after night. It's going to determine your personal relationship with God, and it'll mold your idea of God's love and his grace. And it can restore an intimate personal relationship with each of us to God when we realize how much he loves us, that he's got us in the palm of his hand, that he gives us eternal life. We're adopted into his family. We're his child. As I said before, my son is my son. He's my son. And it didn't depend upon whether he was good or bad. Sometimes he had to be paddled. But he was still my son. I didn't say, okay, Joshua, you did something. You did that. That's, that's bad. You're no longer a truant. I don't know who you are, but you're not a truant anymore. And then after he does something good, you're going to have to, you're going to have to do the duck walk around the house 14 times in order to get in good standing again with this punishment. And after you do that, then you'll be a truant again. No. There's not anything that kicked him out of my family. And I didn't ever want to make him think that he was not my son. I always wanted him to have absolute confidence that I'm his dad and that I loved him tremendously. Sometimes I had to paddle him. Sometimes I had to punish him. But he was never a truant. He was never not my son. And that's the way it is with God. Once you've trusted in Christ, you have eternal life. You've been adopted into the family of God. It's eternal. It doesn't change. He has to paddle, paddle us sometimes. It's not nice. I can guarantee it. Because I've been paddled a few times by the Lord. It's, it's, it can be a life-changing thing. But it does not mean I've lost my sonship. <clears throat> so what we think 
the way we think about God and being our Father is going to determine our eternal relationship, uh, our personal relationship with God. Uh, it'll mold our idea of God's love and his grace. And we need to understand that if we have any part in maintaining our salvation, then it's extremely difficult to live with much assurance. We need to understand that. 1 John 5, 13, These things have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. I reiterate this. 1 John 5, 13, These things have written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. You need to know that you have eternal life. You need to be able to bask in that, that you're the Son of God or the child of God. Now, there's a difference. I want, we're going to go to a different area right now. We're going um, I, I want to reiterate that, which I've taught already, because this is part of securing it in your mind, part of being confident in the love of God. But I want to go to a little bit different angle here. There's a difference in Arminianism and Calvinism. There's, these are two schools of thought that uh, have a lot to do with uh, believing in eternal life or believing in losing your salvation and having to be saved over and over again, okay? Arminianism. Now, there's a guy named um, Joseph Arminius. Um, Joseph Arminius, he was a Dutch Reformed theologian who lived during the late 16th century. Now, Arminianism, I used to think a long time ago that Arminianism had something to do with with Armenia, the country of uh, Armenia. And it, there was a teaching that they had in their country. No, it comes from Joseph Ar Ar Armenian. And uh, it's like saying uh, Joe England's. Joe England's school of a stiff up of the stiff upper lip. Now, you know, the stiff upper lip is English. They, you know, they talk with the stiff upper lip. But Joe England's school of stiff upper lip. So England stiff upper lip school. Now it doesn't have anything to do with the country. It has something to do with Joe England. That's his school. And Arminianism is is uh, J Jacob Arminius. He was the man that came up with this particular line of theology. It didn't have anything to do with the country of Armen or the people of Armenia. Armenia. So he was a Dutch Reformed theologian, and he lived in the late 16th century. He didn't agree with the Calvinistic theology, so you've got a difference in Calvin, Calvinism and, and uh, Arminianism. The two of those are the two main theo theological way of thinking that says you can lose your salvation. So there are two different methods, two, two different theologies that believe in loss of salvation, okay? Calvinism. Uh, Calvinism teaches predestination, sovereignty, and eternal security. Uh, Arminian, Arminius, he believed that salvation was dependent on, upon an individual's own response to God's universal offer of salvation. Now that sounds great, and that's just the way we believe it too. But there's more. There's more. So, uh, Calvinism taught that a person's salvation is completely dependent on God, uh, on his predestination of an individual person. So, in other words, each person here in Calvinism, uh, you were predestined to be saved. And most of the people outside, there weren't, they were never predestined to be saved. They can't be saved because they were not predest predestined to be saved. That's Calvinism. And that was in England in the, in the 1600s. Calvinism. Uh, I don't believe in Calvinism at all. I believe that everyone, God shed his blood for every single person. And he, he knew who would be saved. He knew who, he knew who would not be saved. But everyone can be saved. Uh, it's, it's like um, the Alamo. I remember the movie, the Alamo. The, oh, man, it was a real thing. It really happened. Some people from Texas might really be able to understand this. But the, the Alamo really took place, the Battle of the Alamo. 
And Colonel Travis drew a line in the sand. And he said, everybody that's with me stepped across this line. And almost all of them stepped across the line. How many of them didn't step across the line? I think there was two that would not cross the line. There was a black man and, and another guy that would not cross the line. And they left. There was no problem. Okay. If you're with me, step across the line. Most of them crossed the line. Okay, you're chosen to help def me defend this, this uh, Alamo. The other two, he, he let him go freely with no, no problems. No, I understand he didn't say any bad words to him or anything like that. So he didn't call out a bunch of cowards or anything like that. He, he just uh, he let them cross. They're, they're the chosen ones. And that's, that's kind of like the Lord does. He says, everybody who will, will trust in my son Jesus Christ, step across the line. And everybody that steps across the line, you're the chosen ones. He didn't go like, you, 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 and you, step across the line. Everybody else, you're not chosen. That's not the way it works. He gave everybody the chance to trust in Jesus Christ. Everybody was chosen, but some did not accept. So that's that's the difference. That's the way Calvinism believes, that you have to be chosen in order to be saved. It's the saved, the people that trust in Jesus Christ, they, they're the ones that get saved because they are the chosen. The Lord knew from the beginning of the foundation of the earth who would be the chosen and who wouldn't. But he, he shed his blood for every single person. If there's 8 billion people on this earth, he shed his blood for 8 billion people. Not just 4 billion and 293,014. He didn't do it. That's not what he did. He shed his blood for everyone, but not everyone will step across the line. Now, since the days of Jacob Arminius, there's been a, a, a lot of revered theologians who have held essentially the same view uh, of of Arminius, that everyone has a choice. For instance, the people in the Wesleyan Church, the Nazarene Church, most missionary Baptist churches, and other denominations such as Christian Holy, Holiness Association, they all believe in salvation that you choose Christ. Most of the members of those churches don't really have any idea what, are, what it is that, that uh, they can do to lose their salvation. But uh, they've chosen Christ, and they and they are not secure because they they think they can lose their salvation. Everybody has a free choice, but they think you can lose it. But they're just not sure what it takes to lose it. Most of the modern Arminian church, Arminianism churches are fundamental believing. They believe in the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Um, we'll go. Another sermon is what are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. I don't know if you've been taught that before, but I, I will go over it maybe before I leave. <clears throat> but I want to show you something a little more in-depth concerning Arminianism. Among those who believe salvation can be lost. So remember, the, the Calvinists believe that only certain people can be saved. Arminius, Arminianism believes that everyone can be saved, that anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ can be saved. And that's the same thing as we believe. For Arminianism, like Calvinism, believes you can lose your salvation. So there's... Well, let me talk about... Um, one can lose their salvation by abandoning their faith. There's some, some th ways that they believe, because um, there's two schools of thought here uh, with a more in-depth teaching on uh, Arminianism here. Among those who believe they can lose their salvation, they, they, their salvation can be lost, there's two schools of thought in that also. You lose your salvation, there's two schools of thought uh, among the Arminian theology. The first one is you can lose your salvation by abandoning your faith. They're considered an apostate. That's a person with a rebellious heart. 
Scriptural references to falling away is what they call apostasy or loss of salvation. Now, this is what the Arminians believe, okay? They do believe you're saved by faith, you choose it, but you can fall away. Um, a person committing a sin does not necessarily lose his salvation, but a person who deliberately turns away from the church, Christ, and all that he stands for is definitely an apostate. That's what Arminianism believes. The parable of the sower is it's used to illustrate that point. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15, if you're taking down references. The soil which, which the seed falls on is compared to the recipients of the gospel and the response to the truth. The rocky soil is considered an apostate. Now, that's the first one. The second one is one can lose their salvation by being led astray. In other words, one who loses his salvation by believing false doctrine after you've already been trusted in Christ. In other words, this on Okinawa, I, when I had the first nine years it was, I was there, I baptized over 500 people. And I wouldn't have baptized anybody unless they'd trusted in Christ. Those are the ones that were saved right there on Okinawa. I'm not talking about the ones that came in already saved and started coming to church. I'm talking about the ones that, that we got saved. But most of our people were there for only six months to a year. The biggest bulk is there only six months. I didn't have a chance to work with them. I could just tell them, man, you need to get into a good church when you get back to the States. Some of them didn't. Some of them got into some bad teaching. Does that mean they lost their salvation because they were taught wrong? No, they, they trusted in Christ for salvation. And because they had bad teaching later on, and they got turned away in some way or another, it doesn't mean they lost their salvation. So they're talking, you can be, uh, lose your salvation by being led wrong. And they say that Paul, in shock, expresses his concern for Christians who've deserted the truth and, and turned to a different gospel in Galatians. Let me read this. Verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Furthermore, he says in, in Galatians 5, 4, and 7, he says, Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. You did not run well. You did... Uh, you did... You did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? And in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, but I want you to understand, note that in both of these examples, the believers didn't fall into sin morally or ethically, of the truth. So this Arminius, Arminian doctrine, it uh, makes folks lose their salvation as a result of their naivety. So you better watch out, especially non-thinkers. According to them, and according to their teaching, you can lose your salvation. Now for the third point I bring to you, the main point, we want to see, a, follow with me here, we see a scarcity of clarity. We see a paucity of simplicity. An absence of translucence. A lack of lucidity. Or just to make it simple, there's a miss of clearness here. You don't you don't see you don't you don't see it clearly, okay? These are pl playing with words, all right. Most people who believe that they can lose their salvation just because it is it's because it's what they have been told or taught. Most people think they lose their salvation just because of what they've been told or taught. And that's what they what they think. A person come, goes to church, like all these folks come to Okinawa, they get saved, and they're there for a little while, they they get taught sound doctrine, and then they go back to the States and get into a different church. And then they start being taught they can lose their salvation. They go, oh, man. I'm not even sure. They've lost their, 
they're not sure if they lost their salvation or not. Why? Because they were taught differently. They, they didn't have they didn't have the background. They, had, uh, they hadn't been there long enough to get a good, solid background. Most of the people who believe, believe they can lose their salvation is because what they've been taught or they told. They've never really thought it out. They've never really reasoned it out. They've never really studied it out. Well, I'm telling you right now, you cannot lose your salvation, and I'm giving you several reasons why you can't lose it. People who believe they can lose their salvation are usually unclear about how and when they lose their salvation. They're not sure how they lost it or exactly when or exactly what they had to do to lose their salvation. They just know they've lost it. I'm, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to lose it. I'm not sure. I, I hope. How can you go to bed at night being confident in the Lord? You lay there. Oh, Lord. I hope I didn't lose my salvation today when I said something I shouldn't have said. No, they shouldn't have said it. You shouldn't have done it. But nevertheless, you haven't lost your salvation. Remember way back when you trusted in Christ? You had eternal life then. That's eternal life. And it's not ever how long you can stay saved. It's eternal life. So, these people who are not sure that they've lost their salvation, uh, they're just adamant that you can lose it. So the first school of thought says, you can lose your salvation by turning your back on the Christian faith. The second school of thought says that you can lose your salvation according to a lifestyle of living. In other words, they believe that a person's security is dependent upon the willingness to continually aspire towards some undefined or unclear degree of spiritual perfection. Do you see how nebulous that is? Do you understand that the, that's not the way the Lord teaches, and that's not the way the Lord wants you? He wants you to be confident in your salvation. I wanted my son to be confident that he's my son, that he's a truant, that he lives in my family. I want him to be confident and not have to worry about being canned out of the family. He did something wrong. What kind of way of living is that? And that's, that's the same way it is with the Lord. He wants you to be confident. How can you be, a, how can you be an inspiration to others coming to know Christ if you're not even sure if you're saved or not? Often the typical conversation with folks goes kind of like this. So you put your faith in Jesus Christ shed blood for salvation. Yes, I believe he died for me, and I prayed and asked him to save me. And I know that he did. He's living in my heart today. Uh, so if you die tomorrow of a heart attack on a hot, humid, three-mile run, you go to heaven. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> What kind of confidence is that? Person's not sure if he's still saved or not. Or, or, man, this is Friday night. I'm going out in town. Tomorrow morning we've got to run. If I die on that run tomorrow, I hope I'm okay tonight. I hope I don't mess up tonight. You see what I'm talking about? The Lord doesn't want you to. He doesn't want you to go out and, and, and do things you had not to do, but he doesn't want you to live a life of, of not knowing, of a, not being assured of your salvation. And that's the kind of people that don't have any assurance of salvation because they've been taught differently. Or they think they've done something that, that made them lose their salvation. They go to bed at night hoping that they're going to still be saved when they, when they die, hoping that if they that they won't become unadopted into the family of God. That they won't become two-thirds of a person. What do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean two-thirds of a person? You know, when we were born into this earth, we were born body and soul. When God created man, he created man a trichotomy. Do you know what that is? A trichotomy is body, soul, and spirit. God made man a trichotomy. God made man body, soul, and spirit. When sin entered into the world, God took that spirit away. Read it. It says, it says right there in the Bible. I, I don't have my reference with me right now. But the Bible says we've lost our spirit. 
And not again until we've trusted in Christ do we get the Spirit again. The Spirit comes to dwell in us. We have a spirit. So when man sinned, mankind became a dichotomy. And all mankind are born a dichotomy. That's why I say my, my son never had to do the first sin to be lost. He was born lost. He was born not, not saved. He had to at some time trust in Jesus Christ to be saved. He was born not loving God. He never had to tr commit the first sin. The greatest sin is thou shalt love, or the, the Bible says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. Now, my son never had to do the first sin because he was born sinning. He was born not loving God with all his heart, all his soul, and all his mind. So he was born a sinner. I had a pastor, a great man of God, but he used to teach that uh, babies sin when they, when they tell a lie. They're not really hungry. They just want to be held or something, and they start crying, and their mom thinks they're going to be hungry. That, you know, that baby was born sinning. He never had to do that. He was a born sinner because he was born not loving God. There's only one I can think of that was born lo uh, loving God, and that's Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ was not a sinner. He was born loving God. He was born loving God the Father. He is God. So he was sinless. But when my son was born, he was a dichotomy. Ever since the fall, all that's been born is a dichotomy. Body and soul. Not body, soul, and spirit. A dichotomy. When you trust in Christ, you become a trichotomy. Body, soul, and spirit. You become a complete person. So, a person that, that thinks he's lost in salvation jumps back and forth from a dichotomy to a trichotomy. He becomes a dichotomy again when he sins or when he's given up his salvation. He's not quite sure what he's had to do because that's the way the people who think they lose their salvation are. They're not quite sure exactly what you have to do. They can name some things, but some of them are awful shaky whether you lose your salvation or not. So they believe that they jump back and forth from dichotomy to trichotomy. Dichotomy to trichotomy. Lost, saved. Okay, so <clears throat> it's hard to go to bed at night if you think you can lose your salvation. It's hard to go to bed at night not sure if you're saved. They go to bed, they wake up hoping that they're, they haven't lost their salvation. Hope that they haven't gone from, from the whole person to back to two-thirds of a person. From a, a person, a trichotomy, to two-thirds two of a person, a dichotomy. Over and over again. From their, when they get saved to when they lose it, or when they lose it to they get saved. They lose it to get saved. So they're in and out, in and out, in and out of the family of God. And that's no way to live. And Jesus Christ doesn't want you to have to live like that either. He wants you to be confident. And the last point is, that I'm going to give you this evening, is a positive salvation. If a person just isn't sure how they got saved, there's going to surely be a doubt about how that salvation is preserved. If a person is not sure exactly how they got saved, there's going to be a doubt. Do you understand that sin brought about your need for salvation? Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So sin entered into the world, and as a result of that, all who have been born after that are born a dichotomy. And they must become a trichotomy. They must have that spirit. They must have. They must go from body, soul, the way they were born, to body, soul, and spirit, all three parts. You know that's like God. That's how, God says we're created in His image. Well, how can that be? I don't know what His image is, other than I know He's body, soul, and spirit. 
And you know, that's how we were created in His image, body, soul, and spirit. And when sin entered into the world, we lost the image of God. We became body and soul. And not until we trust again in Christ, we become body, soul, and spirit. We went from a dichotomy to a trichotomy. Praise the Lord, we're never going to lose it. You know when the rapture comes? It says the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the world. It says the Holy Spirit's going to be taken out. And you know why I know the rapture is going to include everybody? Because after the Holy Spirit's taken out, then the Antichrist will be revealed. But we're going to be going with him. We're not going to be here when the Antichrist is revealed. We're going with him. Because if he went out, I have to go. Or I'd be left here a body and soul. Because I'm body, soul, and spirit, I'm going with him. When the Holy Spirit goes, I'm going too. And so will you if you trusted in Christ. So immediately after that, the Antichrist will be revealed. That's why I think the rapture is coming soon, real soon, because I think the Antichrist is about to be revealed. And before he can be revealed, the Holy Spirit has to be taken out. The Holy Spirit's not going to leave without us. He lives within us. So, Jesus Christ's death paid for your sins. He paid for all of your sins. Your past, your present sins, and your future sins. He paid for them all. You're saved eternally. You cannot lose your salvation. If you could lose your salvation, if it was possible for you to, for you to lose it, he'd take you out of here before you lost it.